Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding USP 797 Microbiology Testing Requirements is presented by Abby Roth, founder of Pure Microbiology. Abby has over 18 years of experience in supporting the testing and consulting needs of the pharmaceutical, medical device, and compounding industries. Her background in pharmaceutical microbiology includes extensive knowledge of environmental monitoring. Abby served as a USP Compounding Executive Committee member during the 2015-2020 cycle. She is an involved member of the Controlled Environment Testing Association, serving on the Board of Directors, speaking at its annual meetings, and chairing committees for the revision of four CETA application guides. She is also an invited speaker for state boards of pharmacy and national organizations. Today's webinar is accredited through ACPE and is worth one contact hour. CE credit is applied following completion of an evaluation link found on the last slide in the presentation handout. You can find the handout on the lower portion of the GoToWebinar toolbox under Handouts. We are recording this session and will include the recording and evaluation link in a follow-up email. Questions may be submitted throughout the webinar using the GoToWebinar toolbox on the right side of your screen under the Questions tab. We will answer the questions submitted following the presentation. If we do not get to your question today, a list of questions and answers will be emailed to all attendees following the webinar. Thank you for joining today's session. All right, thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody. I'm glad everybody was able to join today. So we'll get started. Here are the disclosures of nothing to declare as far as conflicts of interest and so on. And here is all the continuing education credit information um, if you're going to be uh, getting CE for this. So there are a couple learning objectives that I wanted to review here. So first, at the end of this, you should be able to describe the sampling frequencies for viable air and surface sampling. And there might be some of you that can already do that. Um, also, you should be able to list the incubation parameters for USP 797 required microbiology test samples. So we're going to talk not only about viable air and surface, but also sterility um, and endotoxin testing. As you can see, you'll also be able to identify the compounded sterile preparation categories that are going to require those particular tests. So to get this started, we do have to just review the compounding categories. Probably many of you are very familiar with these categories as we've seen them um, as part of the 2019 version of the chapter. So we did see the category one, category two. With the new chapter, we will see category three CSPs. So differences here, category one can be done in a segregated compounding area, category two and three need clean room suites. As far as some of the additional testing, if you're doing category one compounds, there's no sterility testing required, no endotoxin testing. Category two, this is dependent on the BUDs you'd like to assign. Um, and it also is dependent on how you're going to sterilize um, a product if you are going to um, be doing non-sterile to sterile uh, compounding. So there's some things to look at there. Also, um, category three, this must be done. So you're going to be doing sterility testing and endotoxin testing will be required if non-sterile components are used for injectable CSPs only. Um, with the category two and category three, obviously you're going to be afforded longer dating, but that's going to be dependent on whether or not you do sterility testing and also the sterilization method that you choose. Um, one thing that I do want to point out, which I think there's still some confusion surrounding this, is that you can now compound non-sterile to sterile preparations under any of these categories. So what we had in the past was high-risk compounding, that non-sterile to sterile, having to be done in a clean room, and that's no longer the case. So just something to keep in mind as um, we move forward here with what these categories look like. So I wanted to start off by reviewing the microbiology related competency assessments, and these are the big ones. So within the chapter, we see initial competency requirements. And 
as many of you are familiar with, we have to do a garbing and hand hygiene competency. The way the chapter now defines this competency is that it is going to include a visual observation, as it had in the past, and also glove fingertip testing. As part of this initial competency, it has to be done three times, and the individuals participating in this competency must pass consecutively. So what this means is that if you run them through the observation and glove fingertip three times, and the last one, they don't pass the glove fingertip testing, they are going to be required to repeat that three additional times, hopefully getting three consecutive passing results. We're pretty much familiar with this, um, as this is what had been in the 2008 version of the chapter. Now, when it comes to additional initial competency for aseptic manipulation, things are a little bit different. Um, we do still have the media fill test. We do still have glove fingertip testing post media fill test, but now we have the addition of surface sampling and the requirement of a surface sample being collected in the direct compounding area after the media fill test. Um, as in the past, there's no definition of the number of replicates that have to be done or the number of media fill units that have to be prepared, so that's for you to decide. On the flip side of this, the ongoing competency requirements are similar, but there are some differences here. So one of the big differences is that you are required to do glove fingertip testing post garbing and hand hygiene competency for the ongoing. When you looked at the 2008 version, this wasn't very clear, but it is specifically defined now that um, every time that an ongoing garbing and hand hygiene competency is performed, it includes visual observation and glove fingertip testing. This only needs like one replicate at this point. Um, I am gonna talk about the competency frequencies on the next slide, so we'll get to that. For the aseptic manipulation competency, again, replicates are not specified, and this ongoing will include the media fill, the glove fingertip, and also the surface sampling, which is different. For the frequency requirements of these competencies, those that are gonna compound category one and category two CSPs are doing this initially and at least every six months thereafter. Um, for the category three compounders, it's initially and at least every three months. And what you have to remember is that if you're gonna be doing any category three compounding, you're gonna be all in on these frequencies, even if this is something that you don't do routinely kind of all of the time. Category three is kind of like an all in. If you're gonna do it, you're gonna be doing all of the additional quality requirements that go along with that particular um, category. The other really cool thing that got added to the chapter was they've divided out um, who does compounding from who oversees compounding. And they did make this very clear um, in the chapter that you have your people that are actually physically doing the compounding, could be technicians, could be pharmacists, but then you have those that oversee compounding. And this could be the designated person um, or other pharmacists that sit in this role. What's so great about this is that those that are overseeing the compounding process, but don't ever actually compound, they are doing these competencies initially and then at least annually. So being able to push this out a little bit farther um, and make it a little bit more palatable of like, hey, you're still gonna have to do this, show that you're competent, but you don't have to do it as frequently as those that are compounding. Just make sure that at any point, these individuals that are overseeing compounding have to compound, they then fall into being required to do it at the frequency based on the category that they are compounding. So media that is going to be used for glove fingertip testing. So I wanted to talk here a little bit now about the microbiological requirements. Still using TSA, um, the media must contain neutralizing agents such as lecithin and polysorbate 80. So we're very kind of used to this at this point. Um, 
but you do have the option of the type of device that you're going to use. You could use contact plates, you could use settle plates, there's other devices on the market that are available for this um, as well. So whatever you decide to use um, as far as the type of media sampling device um, is completely up to you. Now for incubation, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here. For glove fingertip testing, this is very different from what is in the 2008 current version of the chapter. Right now, all you're required to do is incubate at 30 to 35 for 48 to 72 hours. We see a huge change in incubation in this version of the chapter where not only for glove fingertip testing, but also viable air and surface sampling, that we have a two-stage incubation that the chapter talks about. So stage one is going to be an incubation at 30 to 35 for at least 48 hours. At the end of that incubation, you are required to read those samples. And when you're reading those samples, you want to be counting what's on the plates, and you also want to be documenting that count somewhere, um, whether it's in a software program that you have, or even if it's a paper-based handwritten um, system. After that first read, it's going to get transferred to 20 to 25 for at least five days. At the end of those five days or longer if needed, you're going to pull them out and you're going to read them at that point, documenting what the counts are on the glove fingertip samples. You also note there, written pretty big, is that incubation must be in an incubator. And this is a major change um, where previously, if you were doing the 30 to 35, it had to be in an incubator, but some that were quote unquote incubating at 20 to 25, were leaving these items out um, in a controlled room temperature area. The chapter now does clearly define that there is going to have to be the use of an incubator. Did also want to touch on glove fingertip action levels um, as well. So these are similar to and really the same as far as what was in the chapter before, but it now defines it as like after garbing. So after that hand hygiene and garbing competency, we're looking to have zero CFU per both hands. Anything greater than that um, would result in an action level. And then after the media fill test, anything greater than three CFU per both hands um, would result in an exceeded level. As far as media fill test design, the chapter talks about tests have to simulate frequently used um, complex manipulations. So it's really a matter of looking at what you do within your organization and coming up with media fill tests based off of that. And you might end up having more than one test. So one of the easiest examples is maybe you have staff that only compound non-hazardous CSPs and some other staff members that are doing pretty much only hazardous. So they would both have different media fill tests. One would utilize a closed system drug transfer device, obviously while the non-HD would not. Um, this also kind of comes into play with equipment and making sure that you're considering the equipment as well. Um, USP 797 is still silent on the number of media fill units and replicates. It pretty much is leaving it up to you to say, do you want to just have them do one test? Do you want to have them do multiple tests? Um, how many units at the end of this do you want to have them create? But remember, it also has to be thinking about the most complex process. So in the event that a regular compounding process would produce 500 syringes, let's say, it's going to be important that the media fill kind of simulates that challenge and considers those number of media fill units. So um, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that you are incorporating um, equipment into this as well. So really thinking about um, what is being used? Are you using a repeater pump? Um, are you preparing parenteral nutrition that you're using a um, 
compounding device. Um, so those are, again, some things to kind of consider in your test design. One of the other things that usually comes up here is, well, I have people that compound in horizontal flow, but I also have people that compound um, in vertical flow. Um, so do we need to test them in both? That's sometimes a state designated requirement. So you do wanna check with the state. If that's the case where you have to do both, then you have to do both. Otherwise, you wanna to try to come up with and identify the more difficult process. And because you have to do this twice a year, maybe you have them do horizontal, um, you know, the first time through the year and at the next six month interval, you have them do it in the vertical flow. Okay. So test media is the same. We're required to use triptych soy broth TSB, also known as soybean casein digest medium. Um, if you're doing sterile to sterile compounding, you're gonna be using a sterile broth to start. And if you're doing non-sterile to sterile, um, you're going to be starting with a powdered dehydrated media and essentially reconstituting with water. Please make sure that before you go to use the media that you're visually inspecting it before the test. Um, when you're looking at prepared broth, you shouldn't really see anything floating in there. Um, if you're using bags to kind of start, sometimes you might see plastic floaties, just know that they're in there. Um, but the media should look like as is described on the certificate of analysis from the manufacturer. So when you're using TSB, it should be that nice kind of amber, like light golden transparent color. If it's looking pretty dark, you might wanna get in touch with the manufacturer because that's not what it is supposed to look like. Same is true for starting with a powdered media. Um, with on the certificate of analysis, it kind of indicates what it's supposed to look like. Some of it's very powdery. Some of it looks a little bit more like fish food flakes. Um, so you do wanna check that C of A to make sure that that media looks appropriate for use. You do have two media fill incubation options. Um, so I do believe that the uh, compounding committee got a lot of feedback on this where they were specifying the lower to the higher temperature. Um, so we see a change in the version that was released in November, allowing you to either start at the 20 to 25 and then transfer to the 30 to 35 or vice versa. So it's completely up to you. Just be sure that you're reading at the end of the first incubation and at the end of the, the second incubation period. This is also um, added to the chapter, which I think was a really great add because there was a lot of people starting to kind of ask questions about it and they weren't really sure. So when it comes to identifications for this competency testing that we just reviewed, glove fingertip testing in media fill units, if you have positives there, you do not need to identify everything. So if you have colonies recovered on the glove fingertip test plates, you don't have to identify to the genus. You don't have to identify any positive media fill units. Surface samples though, when you take a look at um, this section in the chapter, it refers you to section six on surface sampling. So based on that referral, you are going to have to do identifications on any surface samples that were part of the competency test. And in addition to that, the um, action levels for the surface sample after the media fill test are the same as what is listed in section six. And we're gonna review those action levels here um, in a second. Okay, so let's take a look at viable sampling. We're gonna spend a little bit of time here. The 2008 version really didn't do a great job defining like an overall program that you need to have in place. It basically was like, hey, we're gonna do some sampling. We wanna make sure that you can demonstrate that the engineering controls are able to maintain that low viable and non-viable particle levels. The 2022 version tells us that this program is to provide information on environmental quality of the compounding area. Um, so it's really more addressing this as a tool as to are we passing or failing. And 
when we talk about this viable error surface sampling, that's really what we want to use it as, is, is more of a tool um, to better understand what's going on in the environment. Also, it clearly indicates that you have to develop and implement written procedures for your viable sampling program. So if you don't currently have that in place because you're outsourcing it to a certification provider or another sampling provider, please make sure that you have in place how to um, kind of collect samples, what your program is going to include, your action levels, all of that. So we have two types of sampling that are required by the chapter. We have viable air and surface sampling. For viable air sampling, the media requirement is triptych soy auger. For surface sampling, the media is also gonna be the TSA, but it must contain neutralizers. So you're looking for that lecithin and polysorbate 80. You might see it listed as tween 80, um, same thing. Fungal media, though, is not required by the chapter. If you choose to use fungal media, you absolutely can, but it's not required. The chapter also gives you the ability to collect two samples at one location. And if you're gonna be doing that, you could use TSA and have two samples of TSA collected at each location. And I'll cover the incubation of that in a couple of slides. Or you could do a TSA and a fungal media plate. It could be malt extract auger, MEA, sarbrodextrose auger, SDA, or SABDEX, you might hear it called. Um, it's totally up to you, but it's not required by the chapter. I also wanted to touch a little bit on viable air samplers. So when you're looking at the air samplers that you're you're wanting to use if you're going to do your own air sampling. And some locations are looking to do this because they'd like to sample um, more frequently. So you wanna make sure that you're choosing a volumetric uh, air sampler. And if you're outsourcing this, they should be using these devices as well. That's going to draw a predefined amount of air into the device, that air is going to impact the auger surface and whatever microorganisms in there are now gonna be stuck to the auger. Settling plates, if you would like to use them, are an option. So essentially all a settling plate is, is a Petri dish size plate. Um, lid comes off, it goes into the primary engineering control, and during your aseptic manipulations, it stays open to see if there's anything that kind of falls out of the air onto the, the plate. It's a really great tool um, if you have a lot of um, open aseptic processing that occurs prior to a terminal ter sterilization step, um, but it doesn't meet the chapter requirements for air sampling. So if you want to use it, you can, but you're gonna have to do that in addition to collecting volumetric um, air samples. Also, the other change in the chapter is that um, you must collect a thousand liters of air um, in all sampling locations. So um, inside the primary engineering controls, ante rooms, buffer rooms, all locations must collect a thousand liters of air. And this was a change because we had been able to collect anywhere from 400 to a thousand liters in the buffer room or ante room, and that's no longer an option. So air sampling is going to take longer than what it had been um, if you had been collecting a lesser volume. All right, so here's the big one with the, the frequency requirements. You can see at the top line what we're currently required to do. So air is at least every six months and surface sampling is periodically. But when we look at category one and category two, we don't see a change for the air sampling. So it's still every six months. But as I mentioned, many organizations are looking to sample air themselves and collect monthly so that they have data to go along with what will be required, which is monthly viable surface sampling for those doing category one and category two CSPs. So if you kind of like a more complete picture of your environmental state of control, collecting air and surface at the same time monthly would do that for you. Um, category three CSPs have uh, 
much more frequent requirements. So it is important to note that if you're going to do category three compounding, you do have to get some sampling done ahead of time um, to show that you have a state of control. You will be required to do at least monthly air sampling, regardless of the frequency of compounding category three CSPs and weekly surface sampling. So there's going to be a lot more environmental uh, monitoring that's going to happen um, if you're going to be doing category three CSPs. The last bullet point though under surface sampling that is important to note is that um, you would also then be required to conduct sampling in the PEC used to prepare category three CSPs at the end of each batch but before cleaning and disinfection occurs. So you know if you're going to be doing a lot of category three compounding this could end up resulting in multiple surface samples taken every day at the end of different batches. Um, as far as frequency requirements, this is kind of your monthly, you know, weekly breakdown. Just remember that the air and surface is, um, needs to be done under dynamic conditions. Um, so you do want to make sure people are available and working when you're collecting these samples. So I promised I would come back to talking about incubation. So um, the chapter doesn't really describe it as a single plate method. And on the next slide, you'll see it marked as a dual plate method. But CETA application guide 009, um, which talks about viable air sampling related to sterile compounding facilities, um, and also uh, it's viable air and viable surface, they cover um, this incubation and they kind of define it this way and it's just trying to kind of clear it up in your head that we got one plate where it's going to go into both incubators and that's your single plate method and you'll notice that this is exactly the same as what I had covered with the glove fingertip testing so in for at least 48 hours reading it in for at least five days and then doing another read the dual plate method would be using two plates at each sample location. Um, one has to be TSA and the other could be TSA or a fungal media. And you'll notice here, parameters are the same, 30 to 35 for at least 48 hours, 20 to 25 for at least um, five days. Before I move on from this, just a couple best practice recommendations for you to consider. The chapter doesn't cap incubation, it just says that you want to do it for at least 48 hours and at least five days. Um, from my experience, I know that if you don't put a range on it, what ends up happening is that 48 hours could turn into seven days and you're like, oh, it's still fine. We're still in compliance with the chapter. That's very true. Um, however, any of you that have left plates in the incubator for too long know what happens to them and they can significantly dry out they start to look like potato chips. And if you ended up um, exceeding an action level, we might no longer be able to identify you know, growth on those samples. So it is helpful as a best practice for you to cap incubation. Um, if you don't operate 24 seven, um, the first incubation, you could do a 48 hours to four days. That way, if you sample on a Thursday, um, but you don't read, or you're, you don't work over the weekend, you could read those samples on Monday. Um, and then to cap that second incubation, that 20 to 25 incubation, doing like a five to seven day. All we're trying to do is make sure that these plates are either getting transferred or getting the final read done um, at a point where everything's still going to be able to be identified if it's recovered. All right, so here are our viable air and surface action levels. Um, please remember that the surface action level listed here for the ISO class five would be what would apply to the surface sample collected after the media fill test as well. Viable air hasn't changed, so those action levels are what we're used to seeing. We did have one change for the ISO class eight where now um, anything greater than 50 CFU um, would be considered an action level. Currently, that's sitting at anything greater than 100 CFU. So 
So identifications for the viable sampling, um, you are required to make an attempt to get an identification to the genus level. And when I say you, it's not really you as the pharmacy where it's like, oh, I'm gonna try to send it to the lab for ID. It's more of, did the lab try to get an identification to the genus level? Um, having worked at the lab for many years and having talked to a lot of my colleagues now that you know are still in the lab setting, a lot of times with the technology we have, you can get an identification, but sometimes that's not always the case. And this was added to the chapter that in the event that you tried to get an ID and could not get one, you weren't like out of compliance with the chapter for now not having a genus level identification. So that's why that reads the way it does. Also that um, term, the highly pathogenic organisms goes away. Um, so hopefully many are excited about that. Um, it'll take some stress off for recovering, you know, that one-off mold every once in a while out of, you know, your ante room. Um, although I have talked to some groups that, you know, they are still going to continue to identify everything that's recovered. Um, and they're still possibly planning on paying attention kind of to those organisms. So it's really going to be up to you to decide are we just going to ID if we have an exceeded action level? Do we maybe want to ID if we recover anything in the ISO 5? Um, you can come up with your own kind of identification scheme that makes sense based off of your risk. Um, obviously, if you're doing category one CSPs, you're going to probably treat exceeded action levels a little bit different than if you're doing category three CSPs. Another best practice recommendation is get the growth identified to the species level. Most of the labs that I have spoken with recently, um, they're already getting a species identification um, and a lot of them are reporting it. So if your lab's not doing that for you currently, I would talk with them, see if there's an additional cost increase. There probably is not going to be depending on the technology that they're using. Um, so try to get a species level identification this helps significantly if you have those exceeded action levels and kind of helps narrow down where you need to focus investigations. Okay, so I did want to talk about sterility testing as well because this is going to be an important component of um, what you're going to have uh, if you're, you're doing sterility testing. So when is this going to be required? This is the clip from the table that I showed earlier. Category one, no sterility testing required. Category two, it's going to be dependent based on the BUDs assigned. And category three, you don't have a choice. So if you're doing category three CSPs, you're doing sterility testing. The table in blue, though, breaks down um, what this looks like. So if you're doing category two CSPs and you want some of the longer dating, um, so you'll see that if you're doing aseptically prepared CSPs, and you're gonna do sterility testing, you get 30 days, 45, and 60. Um, remember that aseptically prepared would also include the use of a sterilizing filter. That falls under aseptic preparation as opposed to terminal sterilization, which would be using um, a sterilizing device like an autoclave, for example. Um, for those doing category two that are going to do a terminal sterilization step and sterility testing, you get 45, 60, and 90 days. This was an interesting ad, and we did see this in the 2019 version of the chapter, and this was really meant to kind of help with waste. Um, when we look at what the, the chapter tells us, the, the new version of the chapter, um, it says 40 or more CSPs in a batch, um, you're gonna follow tables two and three in USP 71. If you have a smaller batch, testing is performed on the number of units equal to 10% of the number of CSPs prepared, rounded up to the next whole number. So, I mean, a quick example of that is if you are gonna prepare a batch of 39, 10% of 39 um, rounded up is four CSPs that would need to go for sterility testing. Um, but the idea here was to kind of help with eliminating some of, like I said, the drug waste um, where 
you're preparing a lot of extra CSPs that are just going to sterility testing. Um, also, an interesting add here is that they have set a maximum batch size of 250 units. So if you're planning on doing any sterility testing, you do have to limit your batch size to 250. Um, I am not going to get into all of the committee's rationale for that. Uh, if you want to, to learn more about that, they did produce um, some documents to go along with that. You can look at the FAQs that came out with the chapter. Also, um, I believe it was with the 2021 version release, they had um, created a document that covered the sterility test changes and why they settled on that, that 250 units. So quick search on USP's website, you should be able to find that. Now, many of you are interested in rapid um, micro testing and for very good reason, a traditional sterility test is going to take 14 days um, and that really can cut into the beyond use states that you're setting. So there are rapid methods out there um, that are available for use um, and they are allowed by the chapter with a couple stipulations and it's nothing crazy. So they have to be validated according to USP 1223. Um, which is validation of alternative microbiological methods, and your lab is going to be very familiar with the validation expectations of this. And it also needs to be proven to be non-inferior to USP 71. Um, so what you can do if you'd like some um, additional information is USP 1071 talks about um, rapid testing. So this particular chapter runs through some of the different technologies um, and some other kind of considerations for choosing a particular technology. Um, and it talks about things like, you know, reagent availability and um, method suitability um, and, you know, a number of different attributes that you need to consider, you know, with this. So it's really good to have an open conversation with your lab about what they offer, um, the validation that they've done, also the validation that the manufacturer of the system that they're using has done. So you get a really good feel for those expectations. So method suitability is also required um, for this. So there's kind of no getting out of that. But again, talk with your lab about how many pieces they're going to require and what they're going to need from you um, in order to be able uh, to do that um, testing. All right. So now on to endotoxin testing. So when is this going to be required? Again, if you're doing category ones in a segregated compounding area, you don't have to worry about it. Category two compounding is going to require endotoxin testing if non-sterile components are used and the BUD requires sterility testing for injectables only. So if you're starting with non-sterile and there's going to be um, a BUD that you're assigning that already requires sterility testing, you're going to have to do this. Category three, it's required if non-sterile components are used for injectables only. So just a refresher of this table again, um, if you're going to be assigning a BUD that's going to require sterility testing, um, that 30, 45, or 60 days, and you'd be starting from non-sterile components for an injectable CSP, um, you'd have to do endotoxin. Um, same thing looking at the terminally sterilized line. If you're going to do that sterility testing, um, you would have to do endotoxin as well. Um, and you would then get the 45, 60, or 90 days. And again, endotoxin is for injectables only. There are a couple musts and shoulds to keep in mind with endotoxin testing. The musts, um, testing um, must be done based on the CSP category and if sterility testing is needed. So we did just cover that. Also, it says that if there are no endotoxin limits in an official monograph or another CSP formula source, the CSP must not exceed the endotoxin limit calculated in 85. 
So you want to make sure that you have access to USP85 if you do need to calculate um, an endotoxin limit. Again, labs can, can help you with um, working through that if needed. Oh, sorry. Also, the shoulds for this are um, you have to do bacterial endotoxin testing on the category two injectables. Um, well, this is a should. So if it's a category two um, injectable CSP compounded from non-sterile components and assigned to BUD that does not require sterility testing, it's a should in the chapter for you to do endotoxin. Um, the FDA had a lot of concern about the use of non-sterile starting ingredients um, and in the event that um, there would be any kind of endotoxin um, levels that would be of concern that you really should be doing it if you're starting um, an injectable from um, non-sterile components. And then the chapter also says that the epidural limits should be the same as the intrathecal limits um, for this. All right, so the last big thing that I really wanted to touch on was terminal sterilization. And the chapter breaks down and has different requirements for steam and dry heat. Uh, one of the things that, again, we're already used to seeing if you're doing terminal sterilization is the requirement of running biological indicators with your cycles. So if you're doing steam heat, it's Geobacillus sterothermophilus, and then if you're doing a dry heat, the Bacillus atrophaeus. Um, the interesting part of the chapter, though, is that the 2008 version did say you're supposed to have other confirmation methods, and it mentioned temperature sensing devices, and that was for both steam heat and dry heat. What you can see here is that um, other confirmation methods, and for steam heat, the chapter now specifically mentions physical chemical indicators or integrators. And if you're not familiar with these, um, there is a chapter in USP that you want to take a look at because I am really not sure how inspectors and surveyors are going to interpret this. It's listed in the chapter as other confirmation methods such as, but we all know it happens when there's like a such as in the chapter. Um, sometimes that ends up being a requirement. So if you're not already familiar with these indicators and integrators, please, please go check them out. Um, kind of the thing that I was a little bit disappointed with from the chapter standpoint is that the FAQs didn't mention this at all. Um, and like I said, I don't even, I'm hoping, and I don't know offhand, I'd actually have to go check. I don't know if the chapter on these is actually in the compounding compendium because if it's not, um, you'd have to have full access to USP to be able to take a look at this chapter. Um, so any of you that are doing terminal sterilization, be sure that you're continuing to use your biological indicators and also be sure that you have other confirmation methods of the cycle, um, which could be temperature sensing devices or could be um, indicators or integrators. So that's everything that I wanted to run through. I wanted to make sure that we have enough time um, to run through questions, but as you're preparing for these chapter changes, make sure that you're reading the chapter in its entirety and don't try to sit down and do it all at once. Like take it in little chunks because it's a lot to take in. And there are some very kind of small nuance um, changes in the chapter. And a good example of that is if you take a look at the viable air sampling section on like what to do with exceeded levels, it tells you that you should resample after that exceeded level. But if you go into the surface sample section on what to do after exceeded levels, it doesn't tell you that you have to resample after a surface excursion. So it's like those are things that we're used to doing. We're used to resampling after excursions, and now technically the chapter is not requiring it in either section. I will warn you now before you all get excited about that, that you do want to resample to show that you've returned to a state of control, because I don't know how we're going to justify that to inspectors and surveyors um, without that data to say like, hey, things are back in a good state of control. 
Um, also, take a look at the other referenced USP chapters. And you don't need to read them in their entirety, but sometimes kind of a, a quick scan through can give you a good idea of what the expectations of those chapters are. Um, so, you know, that you can really meet the, the 797 requirements. And also read the FAQs. There are a ton of frequently asked questions that uh, were provided by the committee for the release of this chapter. Some of them, I will say, are more helpful than others, um, but they're there as a, a reference to kind of give you additional information. Um, and then you do need to reach out to USP with any questions that you happen to have. They can answer um, questions. Um, also, if they don't know the answer right away and they can't get back to you immediately with an answer, it will sometimes prompt them to write an FAQ. Um, so that can kind of be a benefit um, as well. All right. So I am going to take some time to answer some of the questions that have come through. Um, there was a question here that says, do we need two incubators to incubate our own samples? The chapter doesn't specify the need for two incubators. However, it will make things a lot easier, especially depending on how full you're going to have these incubators. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we do want to avoid you know, media drying out. So if you're putting glove fingertip and media fill testing into an incubator, um, and those plates are gonna sit in there for seven days, and then you change the incubator temperature and they're sitting in there for another seven days, which you could shorten that second incubation for the plates if you need to, um, but it's a long time for them to be in there. So you really wanna consider how much incubator space you need. Um, and if you're doing category three compounding, this is probably likely not going to work for you. Um, Cause if you're gonna be compounding batches every day, you're gonna have plates that are gonna have to go into a 30 to 35 incubator every day. Um, so having two incubators is likely gonna be easier. It says, can we read the samples we collect? Um, you can. Uh, you will have to show that you have competency in how to read those particular samples. Um, and for anybody that's on here that is um, falling under Joint Commission uh, accreditation, at ASHP last week, they made it very clear that they are expecting to see competencies on file for anybody collecting samples and also anybody reading their own samples. Uh, next question is, is there guidance on how many air and surface samples to collect based on the size of the compounding area? The short answer to that is, is no. Um, you're not going to find that defined anywhere. You really want to base your sampling off of risk um, and taking a look at where your risk points are and choosing locations that make sense to kind of give you the complete picture of the, the organization. All right, this one says, how do you interpret direct oversight people? If it is the pharmacist checking but never compounding, are they considered direct oversight? So from my understanding of the chapter and um, having talked with people on the committee, yes, that is my understanding of you still have kind of direct oversight of the compounding process and you're doing checking, but if you're never compounding, you fall into that category of only having to do your competencies once a year. All right, um, I think I answered this one. How many CFUs are considered passing for the aseptic media fill competency? Um, so with glove fingertip testing, um, anything greater than three would be an action level. For the surface sample, anything greater than three would be an action level. And then for the media fill test itself, um, any turbid, media fill units would consider be considered um, a failure. And if any of those fail, so one out of the, the three, um, it does consider an overall failure of the entire um, competency. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. It says, for those who oversee compounding, are they required to complete every type of media fill that the technician completes, or can they just do the one with most risk? So that's a really great question. The way that the chapter reads is that they have to do a media fill competency 
but it doesn't have to be to the same extent as those that compound. Um, so you could throw in a couple kind of different scenarios into their media fill test, maybe working with an ampule, um, you know, doing uh, sterilizing with a filter if it makes sense to do that. Um, but, you know, your bag, your vial transfers, um, obviously if they're only overseeing like TPN preparation, they should be able to use the, the TPN compounder, but they're not required to complete every type of media fill. All right, I did answer that one. So the question here is, is it now that you have to identify growth if it's over the action level? So when we're talking about viable air and surface sampling, you only have to identify growth if it is over the action level. Um, if you're under the action level and you've recovered colonies, you don't have to identify them, but it's up to you if you would like to. So there's nothing stopping you from doing that, but you are not required um, to do that. All right. All right, Tiffany, hopefully I, I covered enough on rapid sterility testing kind of to just get you started. Um, not sure if you'd have any other questions there. It says, in ASHP guidelines, I believe there were no testing requirements for batches of 25 articles or, or less. Yeah, that's under the current chapter. Um, also for the 250 vial batch size, is, is it the final yield or the starting numbers of the vials like 300 vials, so we get 250 as the final yield. It, it's looking at like your final yield size, I believe is your final number in the batch is, is what they're um, concerned with. Next one is, can you still extend beyond use dates based on a stability study done for the formula or product? So, the short answer to that is no. Um, you still would have to fall under the category um, beyond use dates. So if you're doing category three compounding, you would be um, left with, and I'll bring that up again, you would you would have to meet the um, dating that is listed for category three, but you do still need stability to support those those dates. All right, um, do isolators require monthly surface sampling? So by isolators, I'm going to assume that you mean RABs, so the restricted access barrier systems, so your compounding aseptic isolators and your compounding um, aseptic containment isolators. Yes, you would still be required to do monthly sampling um, inside of um, that device. Um, you'd be doing it in the main chamber and you also should be collecting a surface sample in the um, transfer chamber of that device as well. And the follow-up question to that, which is also a good one, do SCAs require monthly surface sampling? So within the segregated compounding area, so not the PEC, whether it's our CAI, CACI, biological safety cabinet, um, laminar flow bench, you have to sample in there because that's the ISO 5. You are not required by the chapter to sample in the segregated compounding area. Um, as kind of a consultant to the industry, I still recommend that baseline samples are collected there at the same time that samples are collected inside the ISO 5. Um, for that, you know, no action levels, um, you don't have to do any identifications because there's no action levels, but it's really just getting you a baseline of the organisms that are in the surrounding area to that particular PEC. Um, and you could work it out with your lab that, you know, if you exceed in the PEC, you're having obviously those identified, it might be worth your while to also identify the organisms in the room to see if you kind of have corresponding growth. But you will no longer be required to collect any samples in the segregated compounding area. So it says, do current employees need initial testing or only new employees. This is going to be interesting to see how this gets enforced um, because the requirement now is that initial requires three consecutive 
um, passings of the hand hygiene and garbing competency with glove fingertip. This might be on a state by state basis. Um, I'd really encourage you to reach out to your state boards of pharmacy and see how they are going to enforce this. Um, they might require you to have on file three consecutive passing um, as opposed to just three passing results. All right. Um, category three competency every three months or every six months. So the category three competency is going to be every three months. That's going to be more frequently than those that are compounding category one and category two um, CSPs. And let me see what else we have. Um, I have... Are there any requirements for raw ingredients chemicals used? Example, doing microbial limit testing, endotoxin testing. So it's not really clearly defined in the chapter. Um, however, if you want to verify your C of A, I would definitely recommend that you do that, um, especially from an endotoxin testing standpoint, that if you're not already getting that data, um, it would be really helpful to know what you're doing, but it's not in the, the chapter as a requirement. Is there any way to access a free copy of the guidelines? Looks like, yeah, unfortunately, you do have to pay for the chapter. They did not offer it um, on the website free like they have in the past. All right, let me see here. We still have a couple of minutes. Um, so sabdex and fungal plates not required to sample at all. That is correct. You are not required to use any fungal media for air and surface sampling. Again, you can if you um, are choosing to do so. And then does a non-compounding pharmacist only check finished product? Do they need to com like complete a media fill? My understanding of this is yes. Um, if it's not super clear based on FAQs um, and through the chapter, you can always reach out to USP for clarification on that. Would it be harder to explain to investigators if there were more than a few different methods to media fills for different staff? Um, I don't see that as being difficult to explain. It's really trying to meet the chapter requirements if you have a variety of different media fill tests um, to show that you are trying to get everybody um, doing the most difficult and complex process. It says, We've done media or uh, method suitability on a product years ago, along with extended dating. Do we have to redo the method suit for the new chapter? As long as nothing has changed with um, your formulation that would affect the, the method suitability, um, you wouldn't have to repeat anything. This one says, is there a guidance for which locations require weekly surface sampling. Weekly surface sampling will only be for category three compounders. So I'm not quite sure what else you might be asking there, but if you're doing um, category three compounding, you'd be required to do weekly surface sampling. Um, let's see. I had a little sound issue. So you might've said, if you compound in a CAI, sterile to sterile, is the longest BUD you are going to get 12 to 24 hours. If you compound in that CACI in a segregated compounding area. So regardless of the type of primary engineering control you use, um, you are limited in dating to um, 12 room temperature and 24 hours refrigerated. Do you have to do sterility testing per batch of non-sterile product or lot of not yes so you are doing sterility testing per batch um, can you define consecutive glove fingertip testing does just to be clear does this mean garb 
then sample, 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 or does this mean garb and sample, step out and redo the process two more times? So it's the latter. You can't just garb and sample, sample, sample. It is full hand hygiene and garbing um, visual observation followed by glove fingertip sampling. All right, the last one says, how much does the chapter cost? That actually depends on how many people you are going to have on your account to access the, the chapter. So you're gonna wanna hit up USP to check out the costs. Um, where are the areas that are required for viable error surface, um, like PEC, ISO 5, ISO 7? You are required to sample in each ISO, ISO classified area. So you have to collect air and surface in each one of those. Um, but if you're doing category one or category two or category three, it's the same. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. Um, so I think that is everything. I am just going to bring up the last slide here so we can wrap this up. Thank you everybody for all of your questions. All right, Amy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Abby, for this fantastic session, and thank you to our attendees and the great Q&A session as well. A reminder, if you need CE credit to fill out the evaluation link found on the last slide and the presentation handout, an email with the slide handout, evaluation link for CE credit, and recording of today's session will be sent one hour after today's live session. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful afternoon.